right? You do it. You make her happy, so you'll be all right. Yeah. And and happy wife normally is about happy life for me. Right. That's what Not I'm saying. It ain't about us. her. It's about you. Yeah. So Van says that because Jewish people showed up for Black Americans during the Civil Rights era, he now feels compelled to stand with them now. Let me be what, clear. What's yeah. the white liberal ideology I'm following? I'm Lamont. not saying you. Lamont. No, that's what you said. Like so I'm saying which one? No white. one is free until we are all free. There is no room for any injustice. Peace, family. It is your brother, Mark Lamont Hill. Welcome to the Mark Lamont Hill official YouTube channel and welcome to night school every day here on the Mark Lamont Hill official YouTube channel from Monday to Thursday at 10 30 p.m. Eastern. You are going to get night school. It's not a TV show. It's not a podcast. It is a classroom where we break down all the biggest ideas, the biggest stories, the biggest debates. We wrestle with them in this room together live. And we got so much to talk about today. I want to get right to it. But I do want to send a couple shouts out to my family in the room because y'all are the ones that make this happen. Makeda, uh, thank you so much for being here. Dallas is fine as Jazz LP. Thank you for, for being here. Marina Frazier is here. Uh, Rachel is here. Uh, Coyote, Coyote Hole is here. Uh, so many y'all in the building who have just helped make this channel what it is. Every single night y'all come through and show love and y'all hold me down. These are people who don't just subscribe to the channel. They don't just hit the like button but they have actually joined the channel and they are MLH family. Meg L is certainly family. She supports us in so many ways and she's up present for school every single day. Alicia's here, Baby K is here, Maria Piper's here, Rose Ability is here, Kimmy Aboyade Acosta is here, Chad talking about my vinegar chips. So you understand brother, it's salt and vinegar chips, not just the vinegar. The vinegar is good, but you need the salt and the vinegar. Abel Tesfaye is here. Uh, Adrique is here. Verena Frazier, I think I shouted you out. I'm gonna shout you out two times. Uh, Shayla McKinnon is here. Jeffrey Bowers is here. Thank y'all all for joining the channel. Karen D, Sakina, uh, all of y'all here. Love y'all, appreciate y'all. Verante Deems, Niv LR, Odette Maurice. Thank y'all for all being part of the channel. Thank y'all all for holding us down here on the Mark Lamont Hill uh, official YouTube channel. It means so much, uh, Sasha O, to have you here. Funk Priestess, to have you here. Thank y'all. Y'all help make this channel, but I also want to get going because we got a lot of stuff to cover in a short amount of time. First, first and foremost, Eid Mubarak to all the Muslims around the world. For those that don't know, it is now time for Eid al-Fitr. Eid al-Fitr is the celebration of the breaking of the fast all around the world right now give or take, you know, it's going to depend uh, on, on the time of day. But Muslims all around the world right now are celebrating Eid al-Fitr. The word Eid literally means a festival. And there are uh, two two different uh, Eids in Islam. There are, There's Eid al-Fitr, which happens after the holy month of Ramadan. And then there's, of course, Eid al-Adha, which happens uh, right after the time of Hajj. Uh, it's called the Feast of Sacrifice. It's an annual... Uh, event that happens at the end of the pilgrimage to Mecca, which is one of the obligations of Islam. But Eid al-Fitr is the feast of the breaking of the fast. So for the next uh, couple of days, Muslims will be celebrating. They'll be having uh, special morning prayers. Muslims will greet each other uh, with Eid Mubarak, which simply means a blessed Eid. You will hear people say things back like, Kul am wa inti bakhir, kul am wa sana wa inti bakhir, kul am wa inti salam or something like that, basically wishing people a year of peace or a year of uh, being well. Uh, people will be preparing dishes, uh, sweet sweets. People will be uh, uh, encouraged, Muslims are encouraged to forgive and seek forgiveness. One of the most powerful parts of Islam is the, com the commitment to grace and mercy. Muslims begin uh, all things uh, certainly all, all chapters of the Quran, all prayers, uh, with the tasmiyah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ar-Rahman, the beneficent or the gracious, ar-Rahim, the merciful. But when you look at the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so many of them are about grace and mercy, ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim, al-Ghafar, al-Ghafur, uh, in chapters of Tawab, uh, uh, we could go on and on, right? A, a sabur, the patient, uh, you know, so many 
so much of Islam is about this, and, and Ramadan is a time to really sort of focus on that. It's also a time to really think uh, about what one has just uh, endured after uh, a month of fasting, uh, which for me ended about four hours ago, three hours ago. Uh, you are encouraged to not only recognize the individual's capacity to endure, but also to understand the creator's uh, capacity to provide, the, capa the, the, the creator's capacity uh, to sustain you, to be, to give the razak, um, the provision. Uh, and so you're going to see a lot of celebrations. You're going to see a lot of joy. And I want to say something specifically about Black Muslims. And I'm not saying this to be uh, divisive. Uh, I'm saying this to say that if you're trying to understand Black Islam, uh, here in the United States, you're going to see uh, Eid celebrations all around the country. And in the masajid, in the mosques that are Black, you are going to see a really interesting thing, which I love, right, since I was a teenager. And that is that Black folk have their own traditions. Black Muslims have their own traditions. Not different religious traditions, not different religious rituals, but different, different modes of expression. You're going to see Black Muslims dressed the way Black Muslims dress. The food at the Eid is going to be different. You're going to see Black eyed peas. You're going to see collard greens. You're going to see sweet potato pie. You might even see mac and cheese, which, you know, is nasty, but whatever. Do your thing. You're going to see all of the elements of Black culture and Black society that are bound up in Islam. So for Black Muslims, at least a large chunk of Black Muslims, the goal isn't to be Arabs. The goal isn't to walk around to walk around as if you're in Saudi Arabia, uh, but instead to link your own cultural practices, your own cultural traditions to your faith practices and faith uh, traditions. Uh, it is also an opportunity for specifically this year to think about those who are less fortunate. There's not gonna be um, an elaborate Eid celebration in Gaza. There's not gonna be an elaborate Eid celebration in, in, in Darfur or in uh, Khartoum in Sudan. There's not going to be uh, opportunities for that such because of the extraordinary uh, horrors that are taking place in those respective countries. And so uh, it's also important during the Eid to, 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 <clears throat> to think about the less fortunate, think about those who endured the fast but aren't getting the relief that we're getting. Um, it's also an opportunity for zakat, uh, also known as zakat al-fitr. Right, which means that during the breaking of the fast, there's a specific time for alms or charity. It's an opportunity to be a blessing to others. It's an opportunity to distribute one's wealth to the less fortunate. And so let's think about that during this Eid. But once again, Eid uh, Mubarak to to all <laughs> we'll say to cool to all the Muslims uh, around the country uh, and around the world. And um, what a blessed time to be alive! All right, family. Let's move on to another story. A story that honestly is not good news. Uh, today in Arizona, there was some really, really bad news that was doled out by the Arizona Supreme Court. The Arizona Supreme Court today ruled that the state must adhere to a law that bans abortion in all circumstances except for when a mother's life is at risk. This is the most restrictive, the most retrograde, the most uh, disturbing uh, piece of or, or, or decision made by a court in Arizona in a long, long time. They're saying effectively that the that that, that they are reinstating an old uh, anti-abortion law. Do you know when the anti-abortion law was created? Do you know when the anti-abortion law was created? The anti-abortion law was created in ninth excuse me in 1864. 1864. Arizona didn't even become a state until 1912. That means that literally the Arizona Supreme Court has decided, the Arizona Supreme Court has decided that it is appropriate for the state to follow a law that was created before the state became a state. 1864, is that right? That's what I said, 1864. Black folk weren't even...
You got you got laws that are on the books in every in every in every state, every single state, right? Um, and they're on the books. We don't follow them. We don't acknowledge them. They don't shape our lives. But they want to go to a law that was enacted before the Civil War ended. And the law outlaws abortion from the moment of conception. The only exception is if a mother will die if she doesn't get the abortion. That means that if your uh, child at 12 years old gets molested and has a baby, gets impregnated, she's got to have a baby. If God forbid a parent or a family member molests a child and it's incest, it's legally deemed incest, and the child is impregnated, got to have the baby. They have no regard for even the most basic decency. Now, you have to understand, in Arizona, abortion has been legal up to 15 weeks. Uh, but since Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court almost two years ago, you know, um, there's been fights. Um, there's been debates. One of the legal debates was, could an 1864 law be enforced? And the court said, yes. Now, it's a little more complicated than that, but it's important to understand that the court did say, yes, this law, a pre-statehood law, is enforceable. The court ruled that four to two. They said that because the federal right to abortion had been overturned or repealed or whatever you want to say by the court in 2022, there was no federal or state law that prevented Arizona from going back to a law from 1864. Now, they made some other um, provisions and some other observations that we can talk about. But the court explicitly said physicians are now on notice that all abortions, except those necessary to save a woman's life, are illegal. That means that your doctor will go to jail. That means people who um, uh, who, who, who help or aid and abet someone getting an abortion can go to jail. Doctors will lose licenses, right? Clinics are being shut down. If you're in Arizona, you got to go to California. You got to go to New Mexico. You got to go to Colorado to end the pregnancy. I'm going to say that again. If you want to end a pregnancy in Arizona, you still have options, but you're going to have to go to California. You're going to have to go to New Mexico. You're going to have to go to Colorado. There are other places you can go. I'm only speaking about um, what's nearby because right now there are 21 states that ban abortion or they restrict it in a way that is so narrow that it's um, earlier than what uh, Roe v. Wade established. So basically, we're getting to a point where damn near half the country has outlawed abortion. And so you're going to have to make some decisions. Now, it's not effective immediately. The court uh, put the ruling on hold, in fact, for two weeks, 14 days, and they sent it to a lower court to hear additional laws about constitutionality. Um, but ultimately, this is probably going to uh, pass. And we've heard from the state's attorney general uh, who said that this was unconscionable. Uh, the, the governor, Katie Hobbs, you see her here at the press conference. Uh, she is outraged by this. She said uh, that it's a stain on our state. And she said that it's going to energize abortion rights supporters in November. Governor Hobbs is correct. Governor Hobbs is correct. Now, this is where y'all come in this is where y'all come in when i say y'all i mean voters when i say y'all i mean me when i say y'all i mean everybody in this room if you believe that abortion should be uh permissible and legal within limits you gotta go and vote for it because it's on the ballot if you believe that abortion should be illegal you're gonna have to vote for it because it's going to be on the ballot the 2024 presidential election, in so many ways, the 2024 presidential election is going to be a referendum on abortion rights. What 
happened in the Supreme Court, what has happened with right wingers in states around the country, it's sending a clear message. The question is, what are we going to do? What are we going to stand up for? How are we going to respond? That is the question of the day. All right, y'all. Another fascinating case, another fascinating story, one that I've been looking to talk about for a long time, uh, and I'm glad we're able to talk about it now. Um, that is Lloyd Austin. Some of you know Lloyd Austin, some of you don't. But Lloyd Austin is the uh, defense secretary. Anyway, let me just get to it because I have so many thoughts about Lloyd Austin from from earlier to now. I'm looking at people. <laughs> Lloyd Austin is a hack. Uh, Makeda said the headline just annoyed me. Um, look, it annoyed me too. But let's get to it, y'all. I got editors that's looking at me like, Mark, this you're making our job hard. All right, let me get to it. U.S. Secretary Lloyd Austin says that there is no evidence of a genocide in Gaza. That's right. Uh, in a congressional hearing, Senator Tom Cotton was grilling Lloyd Austin or attempting to grill Lloyd Austin. And he asked them if there is evidence of genocide in Gaza. Here's what he said. I want you to hear for yourself. Um, I want to address what the protesters raised earlier. Uh, is Israel committing genocide in Gaza? Uh, Senator Cotton, I, we don't have any evidence of genocide uh, being uh, created. Uh, so that's a, that's a no. Israel's not committing genocide in Gaza. Uh, we don't have evidence of that, to Thank my you. knowledge. Yeah. Better than Director Burns and Director Haynes did last year, last month at the Intelligence Committee when they dodged that question. Um, you stand accused by those protesters of greenlighting genocide. Would you like to respond to that accusation? Uh, what I would say, uh, Senator Cotton, from the very beginning is that we uh, committed to help assist uh, in, uh, Israel in defending its uh, uh, its territory and its people by providing security assistance. And I would remind everybody that, you know, what happened on uh, October 7th was absolutely horrible. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, numbers of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Israeli citizens uh, um, killed uh, and then... Um, a couple of hundred uh, Israeli citizens uh, taken hostage. American and citizens as well. American right. citizens as well. So, so you deny the accusation that you green, greenlit genocide? I, I, I absolutely deny. Okay. For the record, I don't think Israel's committing genocide. I don't believe you greenlit genocide either. Um, uh, you talked a lot with Senator Reid about Israel's responsibility to provide aid in Gaza. Why does Israel have a responsibility to provide aid to Gaza? Israel was the victim of an unprovoked, vicious attack on October 7th. Why should they provide aid to their to the aggressor nation or aggressor? Uh, Gaza's not a nation to the aggressors on October 7th. We didn't provide aid to Germany and Japan during World War II. Uh, what we we did provide aid to uh, and assistance to many of the countries that we've operated in recently. As but not in World War II. If you had been in George Marshall's or Dwight Eisenhower's position in World War II, would you have wanted to provide aid to Germany? I, I, I really do believe, Senator, that if they want to create a, a lasting uh, effect in, in terms of uh, stability, then I think that uh, something needs to be done to account uh, to, uh, to help uh, the, the Palestinian people. I get, yeah. I, I get that, but they're in the middle of the war. Like we, we believe that, too, after World War II. That's why we had the Marshall Plan. That's why we rebuilt Japan. But that was after the war was won, <clears throat> not in the middle of it. And in the meantime, like, if it's, it's not Israel's responsibility to provide aid. It's certainly not our responsibility, but we're spending t our tax dollars to build this giant pier to send aid into Gaza. Who's going to accept that aid? Who's going to be at the end of the pier on the shore taking aid from American forces? It, that's, that's still uh, being worked out, but there, there will be uh, uh, NGOs that, uh, that, that will help to distribute that. Wow. What? an exchange so many things there that either were wrong or just disgusting or misleading and let's first understand that this whole exchange was just a setup 
This whole exchange was just a setup. They bring Lloyd Austin up there and ask him questions. Now, the point of the questions isn't his answer. The point of the question is to act outraged and to make your own testimony. So you notice Tom Cotton is doing as much talking as he is asking. So he asked Lloyd Austin, he said, look, these protesters out there, do you, uh, they say you're committing a genocide. Do you think you're committing a genocide? Now he's got one of two things. He can say yes, or he can say no, or he could punt. Uh, if he punts, they press him and it looks like the Democrats are soft on Israel and then Tom Cotton gets a victory. Very similar to what we saw when uh, the university presidents of University of Pennsylvania, MIT, and, uh, and uh, Harvard were grilled uh, a few months ago. So no one wants to repeat that. So you don't punt, you don't duck, you got to answer directly. Lloyd Austin said, I don't see any evidence of that. When Lloyd Austin says, I don't see any evidence of that, that foils Tom Cotton's plan because Tom Cotton is hoping that the Democrat will give the wrong answer on Israel. And the wrong answer in this case is what we would call the truth. The truth is Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. But no, you can't say that as a secretary of defense because there has to be no daylight between Israel and the United States. So Tom Cotton is like, OK, well, if Lloyd Austin doesn't punt, which is what he's expecting or hoping for. And he actually says there's no genocide. Then Tom Cotton has to then say what? Oh, I'm glad you said that because your homie up the street didn't say that last month. So, so and so didn't say that. So, again, he's making testimony, making the Democrats look soft on the issue. And Tom Cotton is still testifying. And it's really a budget request. right? It's not like a testimony testimony. It's not a trial. But what he's doing is he's making it seem as if Democrats are soft on this issue. But he's also getting creating a space for the secretary of defense. To make a claim that there's no evidence or that they haven't seen any evidence of Israel committing genocide in Gaza. Now, Lloyd Austin is also very careful. He's a military man. He's a company man. But he's savvy now, too. He didn't say that they're not committing genocide in Gaza. He said, I haven't seen any evidence. We haven't seen any evidence. That's an important distinction because he may be willfully ignorant. He may have intentionally not looked at the evidence so that he can say, I haven't seen any evidence. For example, if my homie would walk up to me and say, yo, I committed a murder. The murder weapon's in this bag. Let me show it to you. I'll be like, no, thank you. I don't want to see nothing. And then later on, if somebody says, did you see the murder weapon? I can say, I haven't seen a murder weapon. Did you see the murder? See what I mean? So it's a, it's a careful thing. And the reason I'm giving Lloyd Austin even that much credit is because earlier uh, in maybe like month two, Lloyd Austin was saying to Netanyahu and to the Israeli leadership from Yoav Gallant and others inside the Netanyahu administration, uh, or cabinet rather, that they needed to take greater care not to kill civilians, that they needed to be more precise and less uh, indiscriminate in their bombings. So Lloyd Austin knows that Israel's being indiscriminate. Now, he may feel that being indiscriminate doesn't mean you're committing genocide, but it's an interesting uh, uh, needle that you're trying to thread when you start making those uh, kinds of claims. But then it gets more interesting. It gets more complicated because now Tom Cotton continues to press. And he asks him, you know, do you feel like you're giving the green light to a genocide? He says, no, of course he says no. Because then he's implicated in war crimes. He don't want to be at the ICJ or the ICC. So he's like, no, I ain't green light nothing. But let's be very clear. When the United States. When the United States gives weapons. Defense systems, money, and political cover to Israel as it's slaughtering tens of thousands of people. They're complicit. That's a green light. When Israel's committing a genocide in Gaza and there is a ceasefire call and the U.S. vetoes it as a as a permanent member of the U.N. Security Council, that is a shutdown automatic. When they do that, they're giving a green light for Israel to keep going. So it's just not true. It's just not true. But let's, let's keep going. Keep going. 
Then Tom Cotton is making testimony. He says, why, why did people are saying the U.S. I mean, Israel has to provide aid to Gaza. Why does Israel have to provide aid to Gaza? And then he makes a comparison to Germany in World War II and asks him, would you be providing aid to Germany during World War II in the middle of the war? In the war? Now, here's the problem with that analogy. Here's the problem with that. And Lloyd Austin answers it in a very complicated way, too, a, a sort of evasive way. But Tom Cotton let him off the hook because he didn't want to be out there. He says to him, why, sh why are we obligated to provide aid? And what and and uh, Senator, uh, Secretary Austin doesn't actually answer the question. He doesn't explain why we must provide aid. He simply explains why it's advantageous and strategically wise to provide aid. But Tom Cotton is saying we don't have to, i.e. anything we do is bonus, but we don't have to provide aid. But here's the difference. Here's why providing aid here is different than providing aid to Germany or to Japan. The difference is Israel is an occupying power. As an occupying power, you do have responsibilities to the people you occupy. You can't just take their water and their electricity. That's clear. Also, uh, Israel and Tom Cotton, as you can see, went to great lengths to tell you that, it, that Palestine isn't a country, that they're not at war with Palestine and that Palestine isn't a country. They go to great lengths to tell you that they're not mad at Palestinians. They don't hate Palestinians. They just hate Hamas. So if you are an occupying power and you have responsibilities under international law to provide services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you're saying that you're actually not at war with the country. You're at war with a what you call a terrorist group, and you deny their legitimacy as a democratically elected party. You deny their legitimacy as stewards of the state. You're saying they're just a terrorist group that has taken over. Then you, then you can't just go around saying, well, then we're not going to provide human rights support because that would be collective punishment, which is what? Against the law. But on top of that, Israel is doing more than just failing to provide humanitarian support. They are obstructing humanitarian support. They are blocking trucks from getting in for months. They are shooting <laughs> aid workers like World Central Kitchen. They are killing Palestinians. Look, look, look at what happened at, in um, the, the uh, Duar de la, the, the, uh, what is it? Which uh, round, it was the roundabout, one of the roundabouts in central Gaza two weeks in a row where hundreds of people were shot down while they were standing in line waiting for food. These things are all illegal. You can't shoot innocent people while they go for food. You can't shoot people waving white flags. You can't shoot people in hospital beds. You can't shoot innocent people when you have no legitimate um, belief that there's a, a, a military target there. All of this is illegal. So it's not just that Israel isn't providing help. It's that Israel is denying and obstructing help from people they say they're not at war with. So, yes, the Duada, uh, anyway, yes. So this is the messiness of it all. This is the danger of it all. This is a genocide. And let's not forget that regards to what Tom Cotton thinks or what Secretary Austin thinks, let's be very clear that the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, said that there is a plausible case for genocide. They didn't rule that it was genocide, but they, they ruled that it was a plausible case because they read the evidence, because they hear the hear about the attacks, because they've heard what the Israeli government and power, power brokers in the country have said about their intentions of what to do to Amalek. So let's be very clear here. Let's be very clear here. This is genocide, no matter what the U.S. Defense Secretary says. We got to be honest about that. All right, family, we're going to take a quick 30 second break. We'll be right back with more of night school. We got a lot more coming up. Stay with me. Right? You do it. You make her happy, so you'll be all right. Yeah. And and happy wife normally is about happy life for me. Right. That's what Not I'm saying. It ain't about us. her. It's about you. Yeah. So Van says that because Jewish people showed up for Black Americans during the civil rights era, he now feels compelled to stand with them now. Let me be what, clear. What's yeah. the white liberal ideology I'm following? I'm Lamont. not saying you. Lamont. No, that's what you said. Like so I'm saying which one? No white. one is free until we are all free. There is no room for any injustice. All right, family, we're back with more 
of night school. This next story that's coming up is heartbreaking to me for a lot of reasons. It's taking place in Jackson, Mississippi. The Department of Justice will help authorities in Mississippi to improve their death notification process. The capital of Mississippi, Jackson, is going to receive technical assistance from the DOJ to make decisions about burials in way in ways that comply with the civil rights laws that are on the books. Now, the reason for this is because of a awful, an awful series of systemic failures and, and, and individual failures and collective failures that have taken place in Mississippi. And these failures have resulted in people being buried in paupers' graves without their families knowing. Now, all of this came to light when a gentleman named Dexter Wade was killed. Now, Dexter Wade, if you don't know, uh, was a black man in Mississippi. He was killed by the police and he, he was buried in a pauper's grave without his mother knowing. His mother had no idea that her son had been killed. Her mother, his, the mother had no idea that her baby was laying in a, in a grave site somewhere with absolutely no one there to treat the body properly, with absolutely nobody there to show him any dignity or love. It was just a grave. And the story might seem like a not big deal, but here's why it's a big deal. When they exhumed his body from this pauper's grave, they found a wallet, they found a state ID card, and on the state ID card, they had his address, not an old address, his current address that he lived at with his mom. Now, this person who found it, uh, the pathologist Frank Peretti reported that he found the wallet in the front pocket of his jeans. It wasn't some hidden place. It was in the front pocket of his jeans. ID card, credit card, health insurance card. All this stuff was in his pocket. His address didn't change. His mama's address didn't change. But no one contacted his mama. No one looked for him. So mama's looking for her baby. Who wouldn't be? What mother wouldn't be looking for her son. I ain't met one yet. Black, white, red, yellow, doesn't matter. I ain't met a mama yet that ain't gonna be looking for her baby. Well, Dexter Wade was missing and her mama was worried. His mama was worried, excuse me. So she called the police and reported him missing. This was nine days after the police killed him. He was killed by a, a, a police cruiser. He was crossing the street. A police car hits him, kills him. Nine days later, he, he ain't he home. He's not home. Mama don't know what to do. She called the police. Police didn't give any information about him. This was March 14th. Just to give you some context. March 14th, she calls and reports her son missing. It's not until August 27th, April, May, June, July, August. Five and a half months later, she finds out that her son had been killed. He left the house that day and before an hour had passed, he'd been killed by the police car. And they didn't call his mama. They didn't call his job. They didn't report to the address. They stuck him in what they call a pauper's field. It's a place you bury people who don't have no family, no money, no name and it's owned by Hines County. Now, when they asked Hines County why they buried him in a pauper's grave, why they treated his body with no dignity, they said he didn't have any ID on him. They said the only reason we found him eventually was because there was a bottle of prescription pills and they used the information from the pills to find out who he was in a couple of days. They basically made it sound, made it sound like they did some hardcore investigation to track this person down. Um, he said he called a, a phone number for the mama, couldn't find him. The mayor said last month that he was found without identification and the police were not able to identify him. Now, let me be very clear. I know the mayor, 
uh, choke away uh, Lumumba Anu's father as well. I don't believe the mayor is lying. I believe the mayor got bad information. Um, but what we know for sure is, based on the evidence, the authorities knew who he was. They knew what was in his wallet. They had his address. They had his name. They had everything. And this information devastated Dexter Wade's mother. Her name is Betterston Wade. She said it was another jab in the stomach. She said, if they had a wallet and knew where his address was, why didn't they just visit his address when he was laying out on the freeway and come get me so I could have seen my son? I could have gotten a last glimpse of my son. I could have been there since they had all the information. What took them so long after they had all of that information? This is what, they, this is what mom was asking. And it's not just her asking. Multiple families, multiple mothers, multiple people have made the same concern, have articulated the same concern. I'm going to show you this. Look at this. This is a picture of three mothers. You notice one of them is white. And it's unfortunate that we live in a world where you got to have somebody white in order for it to matter. But it's the truth. It's the truth. Unfortunately, our misery index, our ability to uh, to feel pain or sadness or sorrow is different when it's white people on, 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 on the line. And so in this case, what you see here on the left is the mother Gretchen Hankins. I hate this story just as much as I hate the other story. She arrived... at a burial spot at the pauper's field to find out her son was there too. 17 months after her, body, her son's body was declared dead, she found him unclaimed, buried in a pauper's field, once again, outside of Hines County jail work farm. Again, it's a jail, it's a work farm, and they have a field where they throw all the dead bodies. The, the grave, you know who dug his grave? Inmates. They don't give you no name. They don't give you no headstone. They just give you a number. His number was 645. 645. This is the indignity that these people are being buried with. I don't care if you committed a crime. I don't care if you were a drug addict. I don't care if you were a prostitute. I don't care if you were an investment banker, which might be the worst of all of those things. Whatever you are, you deserve dignity. This person didn't commit a crime. This person didn't commit a bad act this person simply this person simply simply was killed and you see here 645 this is all that was left of her son this was all that was left of the memory it's indefensible it's inexplicable that these look at this she finally got a chance. She finally got an opportunity to say goodbye to her son and have a proper funeral. You can see the proper funeral here. But for more than a year and a half after her son disappeared from their home, she just searched and she just prayed and filed police reports and asked friends. She did all the things that you do when you love your child and your child is missing my heart breaks. If one of my children went missing, I don't know what I would do. And to find out that my child was dead and the police knew where he or she was and they didn't do nothing about it. Oh no, that's a problem. Oh, that's a problem. But they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. And as a result, you got a string of mothers, like the ones you see right here. You got a string of mothers whose babies were buried without them. Now, some of you might say, well, they dead, they dead, who cares? You, 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 you're, you're missing the point. This coroner's office, Hines County, has buried approximately 330 people since 2008. 
And now we don't know how many people, we don't know how many people were buried without notice, without support, without care, without love, without dignity. We have no idea what happened. And people say, yeah, but that doesn't mean there's foul play. It may not. They could just be so wildly incompetent and so wildly and wantonly indifferent to the well-being and of, of these poor people, most of them black, but some of them white. It's all possible. But even if it's true, it's still horrific and indefensible. Everybody deserves a proper burial. Everybody deserves to live and die with dignity. And these people have been denied it. And we know with almost complete certainty that this would never happen. And it certainly wouldn't happen systematically to, 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 to rich people. It wouldn't happen to middle class people. It wouldn't happen to a town filled with white people. But when they're black and they're brown and they're disposable, Oh, then it's okay. And that's what we're seeing right now. And that is what is so incredibly heartbreaking about this story. But I'm gonna move on. To, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna move on. But Mississippi has to do something about this. Jackson has to do something about this. Because this is, again, indefensible. All right, y'all. Another story coming up in just a second. All right, family, we're going to get to something lighter, yet still kind of crazy. All right. Y'all know Lotto. Lotto is one of this generation's young woman rappers. You know, Lotto is short for Mulatto, which is its own racial ideological messiness. I don't want to get into that. I'm just going to say Lotto is a young rapper who's uh, a woman, and she was given the opportunity to talk about who her favorite artists were, who her favorite women rappers were. Here's some what inspirations said. throughout your career. You For have sure. some people that you listen to. For sure. Females to be exact. What are your For top sure. three females of all time in hip hop? My top three, my top three female rappers, rappers. of all time, Dead or Alive. Yep, Dead or Alive. Okay. Kim, gotta say Kim. Um, Wait, my favorite or like the best? The best. The I'm gonna say the, the best. best. I'm gonna okay, say the best. Okay, okay. Whew, I'm gonna say um Kim, gotta say Kim. I'm gonna say Left Eye. Rest in peace, Left Eye. And Shotty. Shotty. Okay. Shoddy. Okay. Well let's All right. So she said, and this is interesting because she she gave her an out. She said, or she asked for an out. She said, the best or my favorite. Because if you say your favorite. You can pick anybody. You can pick your cousin, right? Favorite just means who you like. My favorite MCs, I don't think are necessarily the best MCs. Now, when I talk about who the best MCs are, I'm just talking about of all time, period. I have a very clear list, right? You see it right here. Tariq, Hove, L Boogie, three, three stacks, 3,000, and Nas. That's for me, right? Everybody's entitled to their own. Some... Are better than others nobody's top five top three top one whatever is unassailable no one's is perfect no one's is whatever right? i'm good with that but what mulatto just said to quote stephen a smith is blasphemous it's absurd it's egregious it's indefensible i want you to listen some to inspirations me. throughout your career you listen to of all time in hip-hop my top three my top three female rappers, rappers. of all time dead or alive Yep, dead or alive. Okay. Kim. Gotta say Kim. Um, wait, my favorite or like the best? The best. The I'm going to say the, the best. best. I'm going to okay, say the best. Okay, okay. So she said the Ooh, best. I'm going to say um, Kim. Gotta... So she says Kim. If you put Lil' Kim in your top three women rappers of all time, I'm not mad at you. Lil' Kim is a legend. Lil' Kim made an album. Uh, hardcore that changed the game. He, just the album cover changed the game. She's got enough hits. 
She's got the stage presence. She's got the flow. I know some of you are going to say she don't write. A whole lot of people don't write, not just women. And she's still a beast. And a lot of people who don't write also aren't amazing, like Kim is. Lil' Kim is one of a kind. Lil' Kim is a legend. Lil' Kim absolutely deserves to be in somebody's top three. I ain't mad at that at all. I don't necessarily agree, but I ain't mad at that at all. Lil' Kim is makes complete sense. Say Kim, I'm going to say left eye. Left eye? This to me. I might be the most loyal Philadelphian in the history of Philadelphia. But I promise you, as much as I love Left Eye and I rep Left Eye as a Philadelphian and as just a great artist, as a wonderful star, Left Eye is in nobody's top three, top five, top 40. That's just it, Bunny. I think she was chasing waterfalls. Let's keep going. Rest in peace, Left Eye. And shoddy. Shoddy. Okay. Shoddy. Okay. Well, let's. So here's who you didn't say. You didn't say Queen Latifah. You think Left Eye herself would say she's better than Queen Latifah or MC Light or Lauren Hill? Now, again, there's lots of people you could say. You could say MC Light. You could say Lauren Hill. You could say Gene Gray. You could say Rhapsody. You could say Bahamadia. You could say uh, uh, Rod Digger. You could say Remy. You could say Nicki Minaj, who's the most successful woman rapper of all time. Nicki can flow. Nicki's got talent. She's got a great uh, catalog. And she's been more successful in terms of hits. You got left eye over Nicki Minaj? You got left eye over Lauren Hill? You got left eye over MC Light? Come on. You got left eye over Rim? You got left eye over Rhapsody? You got left eye over Bahamadia? None of it makes sense. None of it makes sense. And you know what? Let me take that back. It does make sense. Because when you listen to Lotto, you say, oh, it makes sense why those would be your favorite. Those would be your inspirations. Somebody said Missy Elliott. Missy Elliott is another amazing choice. Maybe not my choice, but another amazing choice. But to come up here, somebody said, who said Cardi B? Look, if she had said Cardi B, I, again, I wouldn't agree, but at least I would understand the logic. Left Eye hasn't even made a rap album. She does hooks on some songs. I mean, uh, verses, excuse me, on some songs. Would not be my choice. But no disrespect to Left Eye. Love her. Love her music. Love TLC for sure. But when you talk about the top three woman MCs of all time, and you ain't got nobody from the I Want to Be Down remix, you know what I'm saying? That's a problem. You, you can have Roxanne Shante. That would make sense. Might be in mind. That's who you pick. Somebody schooled me when they say Shawty. When they say Shawty, that was her way of saying Nikki without saying her name. Okay. I respect that. I was wondering who Shawty was. I said it's clearly a beef. Y'all saying Shawty is Nikki. Okay. You know what? If you say it's Nikki, Kim, and Left Eye, I, I'm, I still think that's a crazy list and that's wildly wrong. But at least that makes a little more sense. Oh my God. It makes a little more sense. But still, it's a terrible list. Somebody said Eve. Eve absolutely would make the list for a lot of people. And I ain't mad at that. Eve is another one. Eve has a decent catalog. Eve has an amazing flow. She's got uh, great skill sets. I ain't mad if Eve is in your top three. Would Eve be in my top three? No, but Eve would be in my mix. Jean Grey, like I said, Jean Grey would be in my top three. To me, there's Jean Grey, there's Lauren Hill, and there's everybody else. It probably will be Gene for me, Lauren, in no particular order, Gene, Lauren, and maybe Light, MC Light. But I'm, yeah, that would probably be my third. But again, I ain't mad if you pick somebody different, but pick something that makes sense. But these youngsters out there, man, y'all raising my blood pressure. Y'all making me hate 
<laughs> some of y'all choices, man, because they're just so absurd. It's like, do y'all like music? Have y'all heard music? What are y'all doing? That is wild. Somebody says, so your gripe is left eye. It's not just that my gripe is left eye, because again, I wouldn't have Kim on mine either, but it's the combination. You could always have one that's a little questionable, but you got, there's no, it's, it's, it's less about who's on it and more about who's not on it. How do you have a top three MCs and you don't have Lauren or Latifah or Light? It's, for me, that's unimaginable. Now, if you're, if you're saying, if you're saying, Nikki's in the mix. That makes me a little bit better. Chad said, I'm having my grumpy old man on the porch. Well, you are absolutely right, sir. You couldn't be more right. That is exactly what I'm doing. I hate all of it. I hate all of it. Anyway, family, I'm not going to keep you off for long. I got one more story that I want to talk to y'all about before we go. And this is why some of y'all need to just be quiet. It's time for the elders out there, some of the elders, to just be cool. Just don't say nothing, yo. Billy D. Williams is back in the headlines. Y'all remember uh, a while back, maybe a year or two ago, Billy D. Williams was in the headlines because he had people thinking that he was uh, gender fluid and that he was queer and that he was coming out as such. And he later cleaned it up and said that's not what he was saying at all. But Billy D. Williams is clearly good now at making headlines getting attention for saying stuff that maybe he shouldn't say because it doesn't seem to be always what he means but this time billy d williams ain't talking gender he ain't talking sexuality he's talking blackface he's talking blackface billy d williams gave an interview with bill maher uh his podcast is called club random and billy d williams who y'all know from all kinds of things from selling colt 45 to being uh you know on star wars he talked about watching lawrence olivier in 1965's othello if you remember uh when sir lawrence olivier played othello he wore blackface and so uh billy d said when olivier did othello i fell out laughing he stuck his ass out and walked around with his ass you know because black people are supposed to have big asses i thought it was hysterical i loved it i love that kind of stuff now that's already a lot of things going on for the people who were thinking about the sexuality stuff him talking about olivia's olivier sticking his ass out probably was a flag for them i don't care about that love who you love do what you th do your thing what was noteworthy for me was the fact that he thought the blackface was okay billy d actually thought the blackface was okay and even bill maher stepped in and said today they would never do that they would never let you do it and he said why bill maher was like blackface again this is bill maher talking i'm not saying bill maher's racist i'm just saying bill maher says wild shit sometimes he said blackface you think people could do blackface now billy said why not you should do it if you're an actor you should do anything you want to do now you got Bill Maher replying. Bill Maher said, but Billy D, you're 87 years old. He said, you actually lived in a period where you couldn't play the parts you should have played. In other words, he's saying, you idiot, respectfully. You're encouraging people to, to wear blackface. The man was wearing blackface, taking a job from a black actor, and you were old enough to play that role. Why would you want to see that? Why would you want to see your own oppression? They got me agreeing with Bill Maher. That's not what I want. Billy D says, the point is that you don't go through life feeling like, quote, I'm a victim. I refuse to go through life saying to the world, I'm pissed off. I'm not going to be pissed off 24 hours a day. Okay. Billy D, no one's asking you to be pissed off. But you took it 50 steps beyond just not being pissed off. You stood up and said that you liked it that you laughed at it, that you were entertained by it. You didn't just say, hey, there's some racist shit happening and I, I'm, I'm not going to let it consume me. You're saying there's some racist shit and I liked it, I laughed at it, I clapped at it, and I'm inviting more people to do the racist shit. That is unthinkable. That is indefensible. 
that is disgusting. And it wasn't the first point, even in that conversation with Billy D went there early on in the conversation. He said, if I'm going to be creative, let me be creative as an individualist. I don't want to do anything based on this whole idea that you're a black person, you're a white person and things of that nature. I'm an artist. I'm a creative entity in this life. Billy D is trying to do some colorblind. I'm old as hell and I'm trying to revise life type stuff. And again, I love Billy D. Williams. I admire Billy D. Williams. That's why it's so sad to see somebody at 87 moving down this road talking about some he wishes to see more blackface. Now, he's out in the road promoting his book. And when he tells you what, what happened in his life, when he's making Lady Sings the Blues in 72, when he's making Mahogany in 75, there was so much racism for actors. And again, you ain't got to be uh, uh, kicking and screaming about the racism. You ain't got to be pouting about it. You ain't got to be wallowing in self-pity. But you could for sure you could for sure simply not celebrate when people are making a fool out of you by putting cork on their face and stealing your job. Because it's not just that you say, oh, I'm a mind my own business. They are taking your business. They are dressed up in blackface and taking the business. Pause. And you all are okay with that? Oh, come on. This is not okay, Billy D. Williams. I don't even understand. When they get a certain age, I saw this with our dear brother, Quincy Jones, as well. As he started getting older, he just started telling people business, saying stuff that didn't quite make sense, doing stuff that didn't add up. I don't know if this is like a mental breakdown or if they just telling the truth. Either way, either way, I'm not with it. So, Mr. Billy D, I love you. You're my hero. But I'm going to have to give you two thumbs down on that blackface thing. I have no idea what you were thinking, and I have no idea why you would be saying something like that. Anyway, family, I want to thank y'all for watching Night School. We're going to do some office hours tonight, uh, but first, let me just give some shouts out again to the people who make this place happen. Saba Khan just joined the channel. Thank you so much. Bullet the Bunny uh, donated a membership tonight, which is so wonderful and so generous. I'm so grateful. She also donated uh, something else, and she left a comment about uh, voting. Uh, and we got, she said it was 45 minutes to her birthday. That means it's now about 20 minutes to her birthday. So shout out to Bullet the Bunny. Happy early birthday. Um, we love you. We appreciate you. Rachel gifted a membership. Chad gifted five memberships. Thank you for your intense and immense generosity. We love you and we're grateful for it. Uh, Rachel gifted uh, a membership. Chad Zichterman, I said, gifted five. India gifted a membership. Rose Ability gifted a membership. Ooh, we cooking. Crooklyn gifted a membership. Venetia gifted a membership. C. Shada gifted a membership. Venetia also shouted out Bullet the Bunny because we have family around here. That's what we do. Baby K uh, sent a uh, happy birthday message. And of course, Coyote Hole just gifted a membership. So there's plenty of gift memberships out there just from people in this chat. But beyond that, family, I want to ask you to become a member of the channel. You can hit the like button. We need you to do that so everyone finds the information. I want you to hit the subscribe button. It costs you nothing. It just builds our base up so that we can get the content out. But I'm also going to ask people if they can join the channel. If you're watching this on your PC, all you got to do is hit the join button. And when you join, you become a monthly subscriber to the channel. I'm, all I'm asking people to do is what they can afford. If it's a bronze membership, that's fine. It's five bucks a month. If it's silver, it's $9.99. Whatever you can afford from bronze all the way up to platinum, we appreciate it and we love you for it. Please, please don't break your neck to do it. But please, 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 if you can afford it, we ask you to support this independent uh, media project. And of course, at here at the end of uh, Ramadan, we do talk about donating and building and investing and supporting as part of our uh, uh, as part of uh, Zakat al Fitr. I'm not saying give it to me. I'm saying if you got money to give for that, think about how you can use your money to support Gaza. Think about how you can use your money to support Haiti. Think about how you can use your money to support Palestine. If you got significant money, give it to the people who need it the most. But I'm just saying if you're watching me every night and you want to do a bronze for $4.99 a month, think that wouldn't be a bad look. Or if you've been doing bronze and now you say, you know, I like what Mark's doing with the channel. I like the guests. I like the conversation. I love who was on last night. I love who was on last week. If you want that kind of stuff, I need to build infrastructure. And that's why I ask you all uh, to go from a, maybe a bronze to a silver. Uh, and then finally, if you want to go straight to the horse's mouth, as you can see, Venmo and Cash App have been uh, scrolling on the bottom of the screen. But I'll put it right here. 
if everybody right now donated five dollars if everybody watching right now just went to cash app or venmo and gave five dollars we'd be covered for the month for our edits we'd be covered for the month for our uh pre-tapes just from everybody watching right now giving five dollars I, mean, I wouldn't ask for another dollar because that's how much i believe in y'all and that's how much i see y'all as our investors so continue to work with us continue to watch most importantly continue to share the content because we love you and we appreciate you uh, i'm going to take a a, a break uh, we're going to come back with the gaza update and then we'll come back with office hours we're going to do a gaza update in about five minutes right here on the channel you're going to log in under a different uh a, a different notice and uh we'll keep this party going see y'all soon